So we come now to the Bible reading. And as we know, scripture is God's truth spoken to us. So we're in 2 Timothy this morning, chapter 3, starting at verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, suffering. What kinds of things have happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. This is God's word. Just looking at that verse again, in verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You don't see that in many promise boxes, do you? <laughs> I claim that promise. <laughs> Paul talking to young Timothy, telling him about holding to the faith that he's been taught and modeled to him uh, by uh, Paul. Okay, we're, we're continuing our series on noticing God, but just a couple of notices. Firstly, we're going to get a new church sign soon. And I thought maybe we could put this message up first. It's quite clever, isn't it? <laughs> no. Uh, Jesus says you don't matter, give up. Or Jesus says you matter, don't give up. Okay. Communication is always an interesting thing. Um, another another no notice for in into going into the, the final term this year where... We're going to start doing Sunday school work on a Sunday morning, kids' work, and Kathy Iger is going to lead the charge on that. Um, so that's fantastic. We're very excited about that. So do let the young families know, and uh, do let others know who you think, oh, well, maybe they could uh, be interested in their kids having some kind of spiritual input. And uh, so that will be starting in the fourth term, I think, and we're just locking down the dates at the moment. Um, like I say, we're going to have a new, a new church sign. And also, hopefully, we're going to get the playground uh, rigged up. We've got some very exciting news about that coming soon. Uh, watch this space. We'll tell you more about it uh, on a future Sunday. But there's a lot lots going on, and uh, we're very encouraged about it. it. By the way, if your car is a Ferrari, I'm happy to look after it for you for those months now. Okay. Your missionaries, you don't have a Ferrari, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Lots to, lots to get excited about, so please pray for us uh, as a leadership team as well. Now, we've been reflecting on, <coughs> on uh, noticing God. And we talked about noticing uh, God in others uh, last week, noticing the, the image of God and looking into face. So everybody's face has a story. Everybody's eyes have a story. And we, we talked about noticing God's image in others um, as always, when I preach, the, w uh, the day after I preach, I come across the perfect illustration of this. <laughs> oh, did I spell that wrong? Sorry. <laughs> Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> so we're talking today about noticing the image of God in the written word. Okay, so I just really want to do a kind of a basic uh, discussion about what the Bible is and, and why it's important, but also hopefully there'll be enough there for bears of little brain as well as for those who have been walking with the Lord for years. 
What is the Bible? Well, the Bible, I would suggest, is a, a record of God's involvement with our planet. And it therefore gives us insight into how God operates and something of who God is. It is our guide. It tells us how we can meet and know God. It tells us what reality is all about. It is the primary interpretive uh, tool, as it were, for understanding the world of which we are part. It tells us how best to live in order to become who we were meant to be. You want to know God, begin with the Bible. So, let's think about this. How does the, the Bible um, help us to uh, notice God? Well, firstly, it has power beyond other literature. In many ways, it resembles the forms of other literature of its times and context and operates precisely like that literature too. So understanding the culture, understanding the history, understanding the idioms, understanding the way uh, things worked in that culture and the way the language worked is, is actually really, really important. We're talking about 2,000-year-old cultures and language and people groups and 3,000-year-old culture and language people groups um, that are a long, long way from where we, we are. And in, in that sense, it operates precisely like the literature that was around it and like the cultures around it. It is human in every sense. And so that is where we start when we read it. And yet Christians will also want to say it is inspired, it is more than mere dogma or doctrine, it is a belief that God's Spirit chooses to use these sets of writings to point us to the living God. And the story of God it points to is the story of life. When I became a, a, a Christian way back in, in March 1977, it, the one thing that changed from reading the Bible uh, before I became a Christian to reading the Bible in the following days after I became a Christian was something dramatically changed. That's the, ma the only thing I could notice that had changed in me was I'm reading the book on the Sunday and I'm going, yeah, whatever. And then I made a commitment to Christ and it was almost over, it literally overnight. Suddenly this book came alive to me. Yesterday I was bored, today I'm devouring this book was the experience. Now, don't get me wrong, I've been uh, bored since. I <laughs> Sometimes halfway through a sermon, but and my own sermon, yeah. Right? But the Bible is a written word that becomes alive as God's Spirit breathes upon these very human words. And sometimes that takes work. Well, frankly, all the time it takes work. In my pastor's page this week, I note that it takes patience to go beyond a blessed thought approach of the Bible, where you just take verses and rip them out of context, into a life-shaping and long-term investment kind of reading of this book. Now, don't get me wrong, you know I love uh, blessed thoughts, sound bites, memes, fast philosophy, and so on. But ultimately, this book is about framing a way of viewing the world and that's a lifelong process. Now, it also works in tandem with, uh, with reading or listening to other thinkers. But this book is central. I really ought to have brought a book up with me, a book, uh, the Bible up with me, because it's not quite the same. This book, you know, you're kind of going, okay. Um, and within this book, though, the story of Jesus is even more central. Now, I suspect most of us struggle with certain parts of the Bible. And most of us don't tuck up in bed regularly walking through the book of Numbers or the book of Leviticus, right? I know there are some people who are really keen in it and talking about Papua New Guinea, it's interesting to hear how that resonated with the Papua New Guineans when they, when they were translating the book of Leviticus. So that's my Wycliffe background there. That's another story. Um, but... Practically, we, we, we do give authority to this book, but we give authority to uh, significant parts of it more than others in, in our lives because it doesn't have all, all the same resonance to us. And so we are a little bit selective. 
But ultimately, the written Word of God points us to the Word of God, who is Jesus. And that's more than just language. That's more than just writing on a page or in a, an app. There are times when I've been reading some scholarly tome on the Bible, say, for example, on Luke's Gospel, and the author points out something in the text, and I've just gone, wow. I've, I've responded. It's a, it's a kind of God-noticing moment through a scholar. God doesn't as consistently, I would argue, use other literature that way, but he is there to be found in all kinds of writings and of people and God is God of creation as well as revelation. He speaks in a myriad of ways. But no book tells God's big story quite like the Bible. Now, note, it's not a spell book. If you just get the words right and repeat this verse often enough, blessings will flow. You won't have any suffering. All good things will happen to you. There'll be unicorns and, and rainbows and, uh, I don't know, cotton candy. No, right? It's not a spell book. It's not a magical inc incantation. It's about learning to maturely read this most adult of books. It is an adult book, but it is an adult book that children can read too. And it can be read like other literature, carefully and thoughtfully, but by faith we recognize it as the book of books the one that God uses to communicate with us. It's God's book, and uh, it's about God's interaction with creation for us. Now, when I say the word for us, um, there's, a, there's a huge step that has to take place first. It is for us, but before it's for us, it was for them. Who are the them? It's people of the time. That is one of the most fundamental principles of reading the Bible, trying to understand culture of the time and how the people of the time would hear it, and how the author intended um, for the Bible to be read. How does it help us? In it we hear the voice of Jesus, not the Jesus of fantasy or our imaginations or our cultural projections, you know, the sort of white Anglo-Saxon Jesus, but the real historical figure and the one who both is within time and culture and place and language, but also was raised from the dead and transcends all of those things. And in this book, we need to learn how to study and understand this figure above all. And all that he says and does, he is at the same time both fascinating and enigmatic, frustrating and inspiring, kind and loving, and yet also fierce and challenging. The Jesus of his own context but also the Jesus who speaks here and now. And within this book, we glimpse the nature of God. Humanity becomes conscious of who God is. The narrative moves from some tribal mentalities, he's our God, not yours, to the ultimate reality of God in Christ, the God who is love. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And so that is the central aspect of this story Jesus himself. And C.S. Lewis said this, it is Christ himself, not the Bible, who is the true word of God. The Bible read in the right spirit and with the guidance of good teachers will bring us to him. We must not use the Bible as a sort of encyclopedia out of which texts can be taken for use as weapons. That takes some unpacking, which we won't go into just now. So, we read the story of God. God has been involved with our planet right from the beginning. And in this book, we discover how God meets people. We learn that the meaning of our lives is caught up in God's story. We learn how we are meant to live. We learn the correct perspective we need to live God's way. We learn what it means to be worshippers of God, and so on and so forth. And thinking of our series on noticing God, the God encounters in the Bible provide a reference point for all those subjective and mystical moments that we've talked about in this series because within the bible itself it has visions it has dreams it has physical signs it has uh, voices it has uh, uh, fire from heaven all kinds of strange gifts and the bible has it all within it but in the midst of all these moments that are highlights 
and the highlight reel in a sense of, of God's story, there's also God's absence. Because some of the stories that we read about, we think it's happening all the time, God is turning up, is that there's years in between them. There's years of, of this stuff not going on. And the Bible is big enough to cope with that and allow for the absence of God as well, which is regularly talked about. <coughs> talked about in the exile of Israel why has God let abandon us the agony of Job or Ecclesiastes or the gap of hundreds of years between the last prophet of the Old Testament Malachi and John the Baptist God is both absent and present and that's human experience isn't it so this book is not a simple how-to guide because it embraces mystery and struggle and suffering amongst all the God moments, the noticing God moments that we talk about. But what this book does say is that God is alive and knowable, full of power, but also mysterious, certainly, but one whom we must stand in awe of and bow down uh, towards. Now, Margaret, could you just uh, give out those uh, sheets? You got some take-home sheets today. Um, I um, just want to talk about a, a way to read the Bible uh, prayerfully. A lot of us maybe have learned ways to read the Bible in a, a kind of student type way. What's the culture, etc. And that's really, really important. But in the Bible, we don't just read about God, but can also meet God. Sometimes the Bible is not just another meal that keeps us fed spiritually, but a spectacular feast that blows us away. Sometimes it's more than just good education for our minds, but a close encounter with the present Spirit of God. Years ago, um, um, I went to Bible college in the, in the mid to late 80s, no, mid 80s, and um, I'm feeling very old now. Um, and I remember being in a lecture, and the Old Testament lecturer was driving home to us the importance of reading the Bible in its context. Got to read it as to how they read it. Got to read it as to how they understood it in their culture and context. You cannot, you know, just take a verse out of the context and, and, and apply it. And I just stuck up my hand in the middle of this lecture at one point and went, um, excuse me, Professor, th does, does God speak out of context using the Bible? And he responded by saying this, and I've never forgotten it. The real question is not, does God speak out of context with the Bible, but how often? Because what he was saying was that God is always bigger than the rules of language and the rules of literature. So while you have to follow certain, uh, go down a path of understanding how language works based on the author, author's intent, yet God is always bigger. So we have to think about how literature works, and hopefully we're doing a little bit of that in our, in our um, home groups. But God is always going to be bigger than the rules. You learn the rules in order to break them, I think is another way of putting it, right? It's a bit like learning, learning music, right? I'm not a, a great musician, but I, I, I know enough to, to make a mess of it. Um, but what I was, I was saying to Hannah this morning, if you make a mess of it, just call it jazz. <laughs> so the, the, the idea, of course, a lot of the time, the idea of, of jazz is it, it's, it, it's improvised. But you have to learn all these, you have to learn the, the kind of notation, the structure, the, how the language works of music in order to then be able to uh, play doff chords in jazz or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. So, but reading carefully is a complex thing and it's, it's, not, it's not straightforward. So let me just show you that, that sign, give you a moment to read that sign. Yeah? What I if told you, you read the top line wrong, right? Or this one. So we learn the rules. We learn to read carefully. But, and that's, that's kind of two-thirds of the work, a lot of work. 
to learn how to read scripture well, using the scholars, using, using good teachers, to whatever level we're at. Um, but then it's, there's, there's a level at which I would argue that God is bigger even than the rules. Okay. Professor Karen Swallow Pryor said this, um, wrong interpretation is dangerous and we must strive to avoid it. But lack of awareness that one is interpreting and that one is interpreting within a community, within a tradition, is more dangerous still. And this was from a recent book about uh, res restoring evangelical ways of reading the Bible. And she, she writes this profound um, concept here. L let me explain a little bit of where that's coming from. In the tradition of the church, the, the, the reformers of the 15th, 16th, 17th century, um, people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, you may have heard of these names, uh, Melanchthon, Zwingli, you may not have heard of, um, really emphasized the importance of what they called sola scriptura. Anyone know how sola scriptura, scriptura is understood? Any? Any? literally means the Bible alone, right? I want to say not a single reformer that I've read actually believed that in that form. The reformers, in the way they talked about the Bible alone, was that wasn't actually sola scriptura, it was a thing called prima scriptura, which meant the priority of the Bible over all other readings. You read, uh, I've, I've read them, you know, you read something like uh, Calvin's Institutes, and he again and again is referring to a wide group of scholarship going through the centuries. So there's a little bit of um, revisionist history as we, as we look back in time um, and think that we can read the Bible and find the plain meaning of the Bible. The plain meaning wasn't plain right from the word go. When it was translated into German, it literally took about a year before the, the reformers were arguing with one another about what the plain meaning of the Bible actually was. Intelligent people disagree with one another. And you can disagree with me on that. Because all texts require careful reading. We see through all kinds of lenses that we don't always notice. And I... I, I see how beautiful you all look, and then not so much, right? We all have lenses, and we can't look at the sun without sunglasses, but unfortunately, the sunglasses also make it darker and darker. And so, the doctrine of sola scriptura, as it was used by the reformers, was actually more in the way of saying the Bible is our ultimate authority under God for what we should believe and do as Christians and they would cite this or that um, scholar through the years, or this or that church leader through the years. Scripture is not our only authority, but is the authority by which all other authorities need to be measured. And so just uh, to dumb it down, just even a little bit more, a bit of the Simpsons, the, the rather large Chief Wiggum being carried along, um, thinking, ah, oh, not realizing how he's reliant on the effort of 2,000 years of theological reflection, doesn't even realize it. Now, I'm not saying in all this we can know nothing just by reading it out of, uh, uh, on its own. Of course not. I, I was a Wycliffe after all. But it, it's like there is Jupiter with its super powerful gravity. Jupiter is real. We can see it. Uh, God is real. And the Bible speaks of the one true God and the one true Messiah. But each of us are like satellite moons circling this giant of a story. We can all see the red spot. We all see the planet's size and its atmosphere. But over all of us from a slightly different perspective. Now, it's not all relative. There is a reality there. There is a God. There is a creation, a brokenness to humanity, a God working with Israel and Jesus, central figure of history. And this is a huge story, but we need humility to read it carefully and in community with others, both past and present. So, 
how do we get started? Well, I would say we ought to be those who are able to study uh, like a student. Now, you're going, I've not studied for forever, right? I, it's been 100 years since I last did any, any essays. I would say just say simply this, at its most si uh, simplest level, go to something like, I don't know if I mentioned it. Yes, there it is. Start with something like thebibleproject.com. If, if this is all brand new to you, uh, they, they have just, I, I've used one or two of their videos, but they have just really short five-minute videos on, on themes of the Bible that are really, really worth looking at. I, I, for all levels, I get stuff out of them, and I'm sure you will too. Um, they're just really, really helpful. I, can, I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. They're among the best resources I've ever come across in recent years. Um, so, and, and just if you're just getting into Bible study or just getting into trying to read the Bible, why not watch one of, the, one of those videos per week, or if you like, every three or four days, and, and then just reflect in, it in, in your head over the next few days. Think about how do I apply it? What, what does it mean? Do I understand it all? What were they trying to get at? Try and remember what it was they were talking about, the theme, and how does that theme maybe work out in my uh, life and experience? The Bibleproject.com. Just type it in Google, and I, c I can't recommend it highly enough. So study. That's just that study. It doesn't, you don't need to start learning uh, Greek, though I, I, I'm, um, I have a Muslim, I have a Muslim nephew, and um, when he was very young, he was learning Arabic, eight years old. They take their, their holy book seriously in the Islamic faith. You know that, don't you, Sarah? And with all the online material, reference works, Bible dictionaries, MP3 versions, things, audible Bibles you can listen to if you're not a great reader. You're telling me you can't have a bit of time each week to read God's Word. Not even every day, once or twice a week, I'd say. We want the growth of the church. It begins with us growing in passion for God through His Word. You don't have to be an academic. The main thing is you're wanting to know the Word of God um, who is being referred to through the Word of God, right? Jesus Himself. Encountering God begins with studying His ways. And so that means reading, rereading the passage. It means learning what the right questions are to ask, to find out what's going on, maybe online commentaries, maybe be, certainly being part of a group um, to help because reading together is an important aspect. Of, of our learning. We, we've inherited a kind of me and God and me and my Bible kind of spirituality at times in evangelicalism. And for a lot of people that doesn't work, but I don't think it's theologically that sound. We read as communities. And we read this word together. And all of this shows that we're serious in wanting to encounter God, but it also keeps us grounded uh, so if we do have dreams and visions, we know how to weigh them carefully. Don't put too much weight on subjective encounters, despite all I've said in recent times. And it's like a voice of wisdom from outside our, our context. So Paul says, do not quench a spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. How do you test it? What's the plumb line by which you test it? It's Scripture, first and foremost. The intent, the direction of Scripture? Does it contradict Scripture? But it's also why we need teachers and a community to help us discern. But we also are called to study. So study at your level, firstly. And, and, second, and secondly, read appreci appreciatively for worship. One of the results of study ought to be worship. Both Sue and I, in, in our studies through the years, have had moments like this when we're getting into the nitty-gritty and what one or both of us has come out of our study when she was doing a PhD and I've gone, I've, I've just read this. Isn't that fantastic what God did here, there, or whatever? And, uh, you know, so study should not be divorced from passion and doxology and praising God and worship, right? Careful reflection should not dry up fervent affection. That, that could be a party game. You could, you could put some marshmallows in your mouth and try and say that, right? 
Let's say it together. Careful reflection should not dry up fervent affection. Now say it backwards. No, 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 okay. The goal is not information, but doxology. What's doxology? Anyone got an idea, a definition of doxology? Somebody said it. Praise, praise. What's, the, what's probably one of the hardest books in the New Testament to read? Probably Romans, right? It's pretty heavy. And he gets to Romans 8, right? And then he just, he has done all this heavy doctrine, Romans 1 to 7. And then he just bursts out in praise. And then he does a bit more heavy doctrine about um, Israel. And in chapter 12, and he says, offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. The, uh, one of the words there is, I think, logikos. And, it, and it's... Um, you know, think on such things. You know, it's, it's, it's a study word and it's, and it's embedded in this verse on, on, on worship. So this is worship, to study God's word and to appreciate what God is and who God is. And that's one of the ways to approach uh, God um, in, in Scripture reading. Now, what I've given you on that sheet, we're not going to go through today because... Um, there's an old preacher's line, what is it? Um, if, if you haven't struck oil after 20 minutes, stop boring. <laughs> Any familiar that one? All right. Um, so, um, <laughs> let everything be done decently in order. <laughs> Paul writes to uh, Corinthians, right? <laughs> let everything be done. Okay, I think we've done everything that we need to do today. Um, but take, take this, use it in, in your home groups. There's a w- another way. I'm, like I say, over this whole period, I'm just trying to give you lots and lots of options, tools, so you, you have no excuses <laughs> for not getting into the Word, for not getting into God. I'm trying to make it as simple as I possibly can. And this is just another methodology for reading Scripture. It's not the same as studying. You need to do that. That's your two-thirds of the iceberg, as it were, um, to study, to reflect, to think about, to chew upon, and, and worship from that. But there are devotional ways of, of reading Scripture as well, and that's on, on this sheet. So, simply it's this, read the passage out loud. Do this this week, just once. Read it out loud two or three times. And just notice what the Holy Spirit is drawing drawing you to. Maybe a phrase, maybe a word in the passage that he's drawing your attention to. Reflect on that. Just spend a moment, half half a minute or so. Maybe a minute, just meditating, thinking about that phrase. What is God saying to me? Why is that jumped out at me, that phrase? And then pray those thoughts out of that passage, out of that um, verse, out of those words, that word that struck you. And then be still for another minute. As simple as that. How is God revealing himself to you in that stillness? And it's uh, an activity that you can do together as a small group, and I encourage you to do that too. Where do we get to here? We got to the end. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak through your word. We thank you that in your word we can notice the presence of of your spirit at work in the world, at work in our lives, at work in our community and in our nation. And Lord, we ask for you to grant us eyes to see in your word the wonders, the greatness, the goodness of God in, in, as we read it, as we reflect on it, as we tr- seek to uh, have it integrated into the way we think about all things and the way we frame and structure our lives. Lord, we want to notice you. This is our prayer in these days that we would notice you more and more and so be excited by the sense of your presence in our lives and in your world for the glory of your name. Amen.